Rediscover God's Word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. This is Real Bible Study with teacher Tom Bradford. Welcome to Torah Class. In Revelation chapter 6, God's wrath upon the earth and its inhabitants begins with the opening of the sixth seal. In chapter 7, it represents a pause in the action of these judgments, and then chapter 8 resumes the judgments with the final seal judgment, and then next the series of so-called trumpet judgments. Now, we looked at the first three trumpet judgments last week. They were, first of all, an attack of the dry land. This involved hail and fire that was mingled with blood, and the result of it was that one-third of the earth was affected by it. The second trumpet judgment falls upon the oceans of the world. One-third of the earth's seawater turns to blood. One-third of all sea life dies as a result. One-third of the ships on those waters is destroyed. The third trumpet blows. The fresh water sources are hit. Something falls from the sky and contaminates the fresh water, making it bitter and unusable. Now, what I just described to you is assuming that the judgments described in the Scriptures are literal. There are those Bible scholars who believe that what we read is not literal, but rather symbolic of things like governments falling and a powerful angel bringing pollution to our water supplies. Now, I can find no good reason to believe these descriptions to be symbolic any more than we should find the descriptions of the ten plagues of Egypt as symbolic and not literal. Let's move on with the remaining trumpet judgments by reading the last few verses of chapter 8. So open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 8. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's page 1540. 1540, 1540, Revelation chapter 8. We're going to start reading uh, almost at the end, at, at uh, verse 12. The fourth angel sounded his shofar, and a third of the sun was struck, also a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. The day had a third less light, and the night likewise. And then I looked, and I heard a lone eagle give a loud cry as it flew in mid-heaven. Woe, woe, woe to the people living on earth because of the remaining blasts from the three angels who have yet to sound their shofars. So now that God has sent judgment on the land and the oceans and the freshwater sources, so now the sky is affected. And the result was that upon the fourth angel sounding his, his trumpet, we're told that a third of the sun was smitten, a third of the moon and the stars. It was that the days were darker, and so were the nights. Very likely, this is not so much meaning that uh, of the entire body of the sun, a third of it was darkened, but the other two-thirds wasn't, nor that the moon was affected similarly. It probably doesn't mean that one out of every three stars in the sky just go dark, but the remaining two out of three remain light. Likely the idea is that as observed from the surface of planet Earth, the sun and the moon and the stars lost about a third of their brightness. I'm not going to speculate what the cause of that could be, but we are given a hint that we'll discuss later. However, the effects of such a thing, by whatever mechanism, would certainly be catastrophic. Significantly less sunlight means Earth's climate would change drastically it would immediately cool. 
Cooler weather means shorter growing seasons. Some areas would have a permanent winter, so no crops would grow at all. Less heating from the sun also means wind patterns would change. And because solar generation of electrical power is growing rapidly around the world, in both industrialized and especially in third world countries, the output of electricity from that source would seriously diminish. This judgment looks quite similar to the plague of darkness upon Egypt that we find in Exodus 10. However, we should not draw that parallel too closely. The darkness that enveloped Egypt uh, is called in Hebrew choshech, and it means an evil spiritual kind of, of darkness. It's the lack of illumination of truth. And here in Revelation 8, if we take the meaning literally, this darkening of the day and the nighttime means an actual dimming of light that comes from the skies. Much of the Christian world sees this, this darkness as symbolic of the, of the depth and the fullness of God's judgment. Some see it as figurative because they cannot square such an event with science. Others begin, uh, others because rather, they formulate their end times doctrines based on allegory so that all the judgments of Revelation are necessarily symbolic. Now, there's little doubt to me that the illusion of the trumpet judgments and especially of this fourth one is to the book of Joel in chapter 2. Book of Joel in chapter 2, starting with verse 1. Blow the shofar in Sion, Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all living in the land tremble, for the day of Adonai is coming. It is upon us. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick fog. A great and mighty horde is spreading like blackness over the mountains. There has never been anything like it, nor will there ever be again, not even after the years of many generations. Ahead of them a fire devours, behind them a flame consumes. Ahead the land is like Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden. Behind them a desert waste. From them there is no escape. They look like horses, like cavalry they charge. With a rumble like that of chariots, they leap over the mountaintops, like crackling flames devouring stubble, like a mighty horde in battle array. At their presence, the peoples writhe in anguish. Every face is drained of color. Like warriors they charge, they scale the wall like soldiers. Each one keeps to his own course without getting in the other's way. They don't jostle each other. They stay on their own paths. They burst through defenses unharmed without even breaking rank. They rush into the city. They run along the wall. They climb up into the houses, entering like a thief through the windows. And at their advance, the earth quakes, the sky shakes, the sun and the moon turn black, the stars stop shining. Adonai shouts orders to his forces. His army is immense, it's mighty, it does what he says. For great is the day of Adonai, fearsome, terrifying, who can endure it? Yet even now, says Adonai, turn to me with all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, lamenting. Tear your heart, not your garments. Turn to Adonai your God, for he is merciful, compassionate, slow to anger, rich in grace, willing to change his mind about disaster. The reason I wanted to quote so much the second chapter of Joel is really because of those last two verses that I just spoke. And because Joel 2 plays a role in others of the trumpet judgments, God's hope behind all these terrible judgments upon the earth and the universe is that non-believers would finally see their folly. 
they would trust in God and His Son and seek mercy. No doubt some number of Earth's inhabitants are going to do just that. Unfortunately, these new believers will suffer greatly right along with those who continue to clinch their fists in hardened rebellion because the rapture of the faithful has already occurred. These disasters, once started for the final time, aren't reversible. The earth will be decimated, the bulk of the population killed. But the decimation will eventually end as Christ takes His seat as King of His Father's kingdom, with its capital in Jerusalem as the millennial reign of Christ begins. The planet-wide damage will heal in time, as this is going to be home for believers for a thousand years. Revelation 8.13 speaks of woes. But first it gives us the image of a lone eagle flying in mid-heaven, we're told. Mid-heaven means the atmosphere where birds fly as opposed to the sky, which is where the sun, moon, and stars reside. It is this eagle who cries out, woe, woe, woe to the earth's inhabitants. Now let's talk about eagles for a minute. As biblically, eagles symbolize something different from what you might expect. Especially for Americans, an eagle is seen as a noble bird that represents power and honor. However, biblically, that's not necessarily the case. No doubt an eagle is seen as among the most powerful and formidable of all birds. It's quite large and dangerous for a flying creature. Sometimes in the Bible, the term eagle is used as a metaphor for those attributes. And yet, from a Torah standpoint, it's also an unclean bird. It's not to be eaten. Leviticus 11, 13 through 19. The following creatures of the air are to be detestable for you. They're not to be eaten. They are de a detestable thing. The eagle, the vulture, the osprey, the kite, the various kinds of buzzards, the various kinds of ravens, the ostrich, the screech owl, the seagull, the various kinds of hawks, the little owl, the cormorant, the great owl, the horned owl, the pelican, the barn owl, the stork, the various kinds of herons, the hoopoe, and the bat. In fact, so closely related are they in purpose and size, the Hebrew word for eagle and vulture is the same word, nesher. So because of the context, here in Revelation 8.13, we need to see this eagle and its cries of woe, 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 as an expectation that scavenger birds are about to be able to eat their fill because of the horrors remaining from the final three trumpet judgments. The Old Testament often uses nesher, eagles or vultures, as harbingers of coming destruction, such as in Deuteronomy 28.49. Yes, Adonai will bring against you a nation from far away that will swoop down on you from the ends of the earth like a vulture or an eagle, a nation whose language you don't understand. As terrible, as terrible as the first four of the trumpet judgments have been, the remaining three present such an escalation in human carnage that they have been given their own special category and they're described as woes. Let's move on to Revelation chapter 9. Turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 9. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's page 1541. 1541. Revelation chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. Follow along, please. 
The fifth angel sounded his shofar, and I saw a star that had fallen out of heaven onto the earth, and he was given the key to the shaft leading down to the abyss. He opened the shaft of the abyss, and there went up smoke from the shaft like the smoke of a huge furnace. The sun was darkened, the sky too, by the smoke from the shaft. Then out of the smoke onto the earth came locusts, and they were given power like the power scorpions have on earth. They were instructed not to harm the grass of the earth, any green plant or any tree, but only people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. The locusts were not allowed to kill them, only to inflict pain on them for five months. And the pain they caused was like the pain of a scorpion sting. In those days, people will seek death, but they will not find it. They will long to die but death will elude them. Now these locusts, they look like horses outfitted for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like those of lions. Their chests were like iron breastplates. The sound their wings made was like the roar of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails like those of scorpions with stings. And in their tails was the power to hurt people for five months, and they had as a king over them the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in our language, destroyer. The first woe is past, but there are still two woes to come. The sixth angel sounded his shofar. I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel, the one with the shofar, release the four angels that are bound at the great river Euphrates. And they were released, and these four angels had been kept ready for this moment, for this day and month and year, to kill a third of mankind. And the number of cavalry soldiers was 200 million. I heard the number. Here is how the horses looked in the vision. The riders had breastplates that were fire red, iris blue, and sulfur yellow. The horses' heads were like lion's heads. From their mouths issued fire and smoke and sulfur. It was these three plagues that killed a third of mankind, the fire, smoke, and sulfur issuing from the horses' mouths. For the power of the horses was in their mouths, also in their tails. For their tails were like snakes with heads, and with them they could cause injury. Now the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues even then did not turn from what had made, they had made with their own hands. They didn't stop worshiping demons or idols made of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they turn from their murdering, from their involvement with the occult and with drugs, their sexual immorality or their stealing. The character of Revelation chapter 9 is quite different from the previous ones. And this character also changes in the nature and source of the judgments of God's wrath. In the first four of the trumpet judgments, just like in Egypt, nature, the natural world, was used in a supernatural way to punish non-believers and rebels. So in trumpet one, we had hail and fire. In trumpet two, we are told of something like a blazing mountain affecting the sea and the ships that sailed upon it. In trumpet three, something like a great star fell from the sky and polluted the fresh water. And in trumpet four, the sun, the moon, and the stars were dim. But now with trumpet five, the natural gives way to the macabre and the spiritual. And biblically, whenever the spiritual sphere begins to dominate in the narrative, the words describing the scene and everything that's occurring will necessarily become more symbolic and figurative. That is, familiar words that best describe physical, tangible, Things and people and creatures that are commonly known to us are going to be borrowed to best describe that which is not physical 
or is not commonly known to us. So in verse 1, we're told that John sees a star that had fallen out of heaven. It had fallen onto the earth, and this star was given the key to the shaft leading to the abyss. Now, there's quite a bit to dissect here and understand. In the Bible, the term star is at times used to refer to an angel. At other times, it simply means star in its most literal sense, that tiny little pinpoint of light up in the night sky. And here we see that this star that had fallen was given a key to the abyss. So clearly, this is not a literal star. It must be a spiritual being, an, an angel of some sort. Now, in Greek, the star is mentioned in the past, it's called the past perfect tense, which means that the action happened at an earlier time and it is completed. That is, when John sees it, the star had already fallen. How much earlier, we don't know. Yet, this falling angel is still future to us at least in the year 2018, as it seems that this action of the star falling comes before the blowing of the fifth trumpet, fifth trumpet and then the judgment that follows it. An angel that falls means it was expelled from heaven against its will. And now is its dwelling place is earth. Now, the shaft or, or pit, be translated either way, that is the entry or the top part of the abyss, commonly referred to as a, a well or a pit dug for any purpose, it's the association of the pit with the abyss that makes the entire structure an evil place. In Greek, abyss is Abusu, and it means unfathomably deep. Unfathomably deep. It was used among Greeks in John's day to refer to a place deep underground where disobedient spirits were held prisoner. And Judaism actually adopted more or less the same meaning for it. In fact, in the book of Romans, in Romans 10.7, we read this, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. The thing we must not do, however, is associate the abyss with Sheol. That is, the abyss is not the grave. The abyss is where demons reside until they are called forth. The fallen angel is not Satan, nor did he naturally possess the key to the abyss. Rather, it had been given to this angel, presumably on the authority of God, because whether it's heaven, earth, or the underworld of the dead, God is sovereign over it all. And what did the fallen angel do with that key? He opened the entrance into the place where evil spirits lived. Now, whatever the abyss is, it is like an, infer an inferno. Because immediately upon opening it, smoke begins billowing from it. Now, saying that smoke darkened the sun in the sky continues to establish that this is God's judgment. And it again alludes to the prophet Yoel, Joel. But for any Jew hearing this, it would have immediately also evoked this famous scene from Genesis, Genesis 19, 27 and 28. Avraham got up early in the morning, went to the place where he had stood before Adonai, and he looked out towards Sodom and Gomorrah scanning the entire plain, and there before him the smoke 
was rising from the land like smoke from a furnace. And as the smoke of this abyss rises and it begins to encircle the globe, locusts emerge and they are given the ability to sting people like scorpions do. Now, unlike regular locusts who can simply denude several square miles of vegetation when they, they swarm in their voracious quest for food, these locusts are actually barred from harming any plant life. Interesting. They were only allowed to harm who? People. So the fifth trumpet judgment is aimed directly at non-believing people. How do I know this? Because the rapture of believers has already occurred. One of the interesting features of this long string of judgments, all but the first four happening before the rapture, is that while no believer will be left behind at the moment of the rapture, it is inevitable that many new believers will be made as each new judgment happens and some people finally open their hearts to God as the truth of His Word becomes, shall we say, painfully obvious. This is not unlike how some who have resisted the call of God all their lives will suddenly drop those barriers as they lay on their deathbeds and sincerely accept Christ's mercy hours or minutes before their death. These last moment believers are just as saved as those who have believed at a much earlier, since a much earlier stage in their lives. So even though it is correct to say that all the revelation judgments are directed against non-believers, the sad reality is that because some number of new believers will be made along the way as each new judgment falls, they too will face the terrors and the horrors of God's wrath as collateral damage. The difference for them is they will at least have the comfort to know that upon their death they will have eternal security. They will have joy living in the presence of God. Now, I suspect that because of the circumstances and the, the, the clear certainty of the imminence of the end that thousands of the most passionate and fearless evangelists for Yeshua ever to live will emerge from the rubble and the scorched earth. So the number of new believers that are killed during these judgments might be staggeringly large. Now, the only people who will be held safe from these locusts that sting like scorpions are those that have been sealed by God. This can only be referring to the 144,000 Israelites from chapter 7, which tells us that those who are sealed are not dead believers in heaven. Rather, they are living believers who will go through the final judgments of God's wrath. So then, who are those who are not protected from being stung? In an irony that to me is somewhere between comical and maddening, depending on my mood, those adherents to the pre tribulation and some other man made and rather recent end times doctrines say, Things like this, and I shall quote directly from Charles Lee Feinberg in his rather short Revelation commentary. The first of the woe judgments is directed by Satan against the ungodly of Israel. Against the ungodly of Israel. Why Israel? Because the 144,000 that are sealed are said to be from the 12 tribes. So the logic then is that the sealed will only be living among their own people. Other pre-tribulation doctrine adherents agree that this particular judgment is against Israel. 
but only because God is through with Israel. And although, according to their doctrine, the 144,000 are actually representative Gentiles of the worldwide church, not Israelites, at the same time, the mention back in chapter 7 that they are taken from the 12 tribes of Israel is symbolism that then means that here in chapter 9, the people who are subject to getting stung can only be non-believing Jews at whom God's directing His wrath and His rage. I mean, to, to all this I say, this is just unequivocal nonsense. There's no such implication in this passage that Israel's the target. It is only that in order to uphold their man-made church doctrines, that they feel they must interpret these passages in such a way. Verse 4 makes it clear that the only living human beings that can be excluded from being stung by these bizarre locusts are these 144,000 who are sealed Israelites. Otherwise, it's open season on Jews and Gentiles, non-believers as well as whatever believers have been made since the rapture. So in verse 5, we get the information that as painful are these things, they do not lead to death. Further, these stinging locusts will only be able to operate for five months, so their purpose is not to kill. It's only to torment. Why for five months? I can only speculate. But first, five months is a relatively short period of time. But second, interestingly, five months is the natural locust season in the Middle East. The last five months of the Jewish calendar are when Locusts are active. On our modern calendars, that would be May through September. So while these strange creatures aren't really actual locusts, but rather the kind of demonic hybrids, God has limited their lifespan to apparently mimic that which happens naturally on earth. Now, my opinion is that this is so those who have thus far hardened their hearts towards God will be able to point to a natural reason for this locust invasion so they can just maintain their hardness. They'll say that even though these locust-like insect creatures are some kind of mutation caused by man, the proof that they are essentially actual locusts and that God, some God has nothing to do with it, is that they operate precisely at the same season as locusts regularly do. And by the way, I don't know if anybody here has ever been stung by a scorpion, right, or even encountered one. I've not been stung, but having been born and raised for some of my earliest years in the desert regions of, of Southern California, I've had several scorpion encounters. And I know people who were stung. The sting is excruciating. And unlike a bee sting, the pain does not go away very soon. The most common place on the body that people are stung, interestingly, is the foot. The reason for this, again, I've had personal experience with this, scorpions like dark places to hide. And you know one of their favorite places? your shoe. So as a desert dweller, you learn early on in life to shake out those shoes and look inside of them before you just go casually slipping them on. Otherwise, you might get a rather nasty and agonizing surprise. Apparently, like swarming locusts, these strange creatures of Revelation 9 could also fly. I can't even imagine what those living during those five months are going to go through. Now we're told in verse 6 that the torment 
of the pain and no doubt the anxiety of knowing every day you're probably going to get stung was so terrible that people wished they could die, but they couldn't. Now, that death would flee from those sufferers of the stings could mean a couple of different things. First, it is thought by many Bible commentators the term death is being personified. That is, that death, the death being spoken of is like the name of a being. It is like the image of death that we're all familiar with, like a skeleton wearing a dark hooded cloak and carrying a sickle, ominously roaming the earth looking for his next victim. But second, the question is whether death fleeing the person in long-term agony might merely be an expression that they wish they could die, but the sting isn't lethal enough to cause death. Or, if it is that God has put death itself on a short-term hiatus, and people simply stop dying for any reason for five months in order that the torment was assured. There is also one other scenario that can't be dismissed. It is that while people will still die from natural causes, the sting from the locusts won't bring on death. However, no kind of drug seems to stop the pain. So these people want to die but don't have the courage to take their own lives. They are so afraid of death that they make the choice to go on living indefinitely with this horrific pain. I want to pause for a moment. I want to back, back away to kind of get a longer view of what's happening. See, we see a side of God that most Christians don't want to know about or seem to believe is not even there. A side which, for the most part, His mercy, in the way we might think of it, has ceased. Once His wrath begins, the goal is not only to kill, but as we see here with the locusts, to inflict the greatest terror and agony on the human race. I mean, what happened to the God of love? Has the Old Testament God reemerged? Just as the New Testament God seemed to have taken center stage? The one who is there mainly to help us attain our personal dreams and make us happy? See, the reality is that such a God has never existed and is more reflected in the mythology of the genie in the bottle. I want to remind you of something we learned back in chapter 6, Revelation 6. 15 through 17. Then the earth's kings, the rulers, the generals, the rich, and the mighty, indeed everyone, slave and free, hid himself in caves and among the rocks and the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us! Hide us from the face of the one sitting on the throne and from the fury of the Lamb. For the great day of their fury has come, and who can stand? God and the Lamb. Messiah, Yeshua, share a mutual fury. And together, they are raining their judgment down upon mankind and upon our habitat. God has spent centuries, millennia, really, doing everything to bring truth to mankind for the purpose of bringing mankind to repentance and to salvation. He's done everything. However, only a minority of humans has ever taken that narrow road to the Lamb. Now, after all that time has passed, since Adam and Eve sinned and began passing along their sin natures to, to every human that would ever come after them, the true gruesome penalty for sinning against God is being realized. The death and the torment promised by the prophets, guess what? It's turned out to be real. It's not an empty warning. It wasn't a scare tactic. What we are witnessing is the side of that divine coin that is primarily love and mercy, and it's going to flip sometime in the near future to its opposite side. 
And that opposite side is primarily judgment and wrath. And that wrath far exceeds anything that any human evil, any natural disaster, even occasional comic disturbance can cause. Well, starting with verse 7, we get a description of these bizarre demonic creatures. Now, we should not get too terribly caught up in the various metaphors that are used in the, in the vision to describe these so-called locusts because they reflect common everyday language and realities for that era, for John's era. For instance, even the term locusts is figurative. Clearly a creature that doesn't eat plant life, that has a stinger like a scorpion, hair on its head, etc., isn't a true locust. The term is used because these creatures from the underworld swarm in their millions. They fly, they destroy, just as locusts do on a regular seasonal basis. The second metaphor John uses is that they looked like horses outfitted for battle. Likely the image of war horses was the closest thing John had to describe in words what he saw. But clearly these things were not miniature flying horses. They wore something on their heads that looked like crowns. These were not regal crowns, but rather the, the typical laurel wreath sort of crown worn by battle victors and winning athletes. We know this because the Greek word stephanos is used, whereas if this were a kingly crown, the word would be diadema. These creatures also had faces that looked human. Now, we must not take this to mean they had actual human faces. There was just some kind of striking similarity. They had hair like women's hair, meaning the hair was long. This is not to invoke an image of femininity. Rather, it's to paint a picture of a pagan warrior, some feared nation. Perhaps it may even be a reference to Samson, or perhaps to David's son, Absalom. Both of these fierce warriors, or some other known strong man who wore his hair very long. So hair is being used as symbolic of strength, fierce strength. Teeth like a lion's meant they were sharp. They were used to tear their prey apart. This speaks of a fearsome and insatiable appetite for blood and flesh, for killing, for hurting. Their chests look like iron breastplates. Now, this may have intended to call to mind that giant Philistine Goliath, who was actually said to have worn a coat of mail that well weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. In John's day, a coat of Armor didn't look like metal netting as, as it was going to hundreds of years later. Rather, it looked like overlapping metal plates, like scales on a mythical dragon. And the sound of their wings, verifying that these tree creatures traveled through the air, is said to have resembled the roar of horses and chariots rushing into battle. Once again, the image is the same as the prophet Joel tells us. Joel 2, 4 through 6. They look like horses, like cavalry they charge, with a rumble like that of chariots. They leap over the mountaintops, like crackling flames devouring stubble, like a mighty horde in battle array. At their presence, the people writhe in anguish. Every face is drained of color. See the connection? Also notice in Joel that he says that when these creatures appear, the peoples, plural, writhe in anguish. A people, single, singular, means a race, an ethnicity, or those who share a common language. Here it is peoples, plural, meaning it's many races, many ethnicities, people of many languages that are being represented, which furthers my argument that this by no means is this woe 
of locust-like demonic creatures a judgment aimed only at Israel or aimed only at the Jewish people. Rather, the target is indiscriminate. It's a pox upon all the people of the earth everywhere. So and then in verse 10 we learn that like horses they have tails, but also like scorpions, the part of them that stings is in those tails. So while they had ferocious devouring teeth, the really dangerous part of these creatures was their tail. This swarm of demons was not operating on instinct. We're told they had a definite leader. This is very unlocust like because locusts don't have a leader. Therefore, these creatures had some, have some measure of intelligence. And moreover, their leader is identified as a king, which means he has power and authority, and the swarm obeys him. So their leader sounds as though he might be the fallen angel that held the keys to the abyss. However, most translators think it's somebody else. I agree with them. I think the king, the leader, or this demonic horde was locked away, just as were the demon minions, but now has been set free by this fallen angel in order to unwittingly actually serve God's will. Well, this king had a name. It was Abaddon. It means destroyer or perdition. And this angel of the abyss is closely compared to Belial in the Holy Scriptures, and he is also found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There, Abaddon is the military chief of the forces of darkness whose battles against, who battles against the sons of light. And the writers of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essens, were well known in John's day. They were highly admired people. And what they believed in, that was adopted by most zealot Jews. What we read here in Revelation fits hand in glove with the general end times doctrines of the essence. So these de little demonic beasts likened to strange locusts form Satan's army, if you would. And while they are not taking their marching orders from God, but rather doing what Satan and his demons naturally do, destroy and corrupt, God is allowing them to carry out their evil nature in order to inflict punishment upon the people of earth for their sin. In the same way, he used King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon to punish his own people, Israel, for their sin. We're going to stop here, and we're going to move on to the second of the woe judgments, which is also the sixth of the trumpet judgments next week. For more teachings of real Bible study and to rediscover God's Word with Tom Bradford, visit Torah Class today on the web, streaming TV, or download the Torah Class mobile app.